good morning, everyone, and thanks for, for joining. Uh, let me use this opportunity to appreciate uh, Professor Bamdeli Adebisi for inviting me to uh, talk to you this morning about my research experience in artificial intelligence. Now, my name is Shegu Popola, and I'm a lecturer in cybersecurity and artificial intelligence in the Department of Computing and Mathematics at Manchester Metropolitan University in the United Kingdom. Uh, I'll just tell you a little background about my academic uh, journey. I This year, precisely in June, I completed my PhD in uh, Communication Engineering at Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK. and um, I obtained, previously I obtained a Master of Engineering degree in Information and Communication Engineering. That was in 2018 at Covenant University, Nigeria. Uh, in 2014, I finished my first degree, that is a Bachelor of Technology degree in Electronic and Electrical Engineering. Uh, at, that was at uh, Laduki Akitola University, of technology, Nigeria. Um, my research interests include <clears throat> deep learning, federated learning, cybersecurity, wireless communication, as well as the internet of things. So far, uh, I've been doing research in this area since consistently since 2016, uh, when I finished uh, my first degree and I have published um, over 100 um, research papers that are indexed in Google Scholar, as well as other major uh, abstracting and indexing databases such as Scopus and uh, Web of Science. Uh, uh, this is the outline of my presentation. First, we'll look at the introduction to AI and also uh, I'll discuss the recent trends in AI research as of, as of today. Also, uh, we'll look at the learning methods, the architectural, ML, uh, machine learning, and deep learning processes. And I'll also provide uh, or present some of the available frameworks, tools, and libraries that you need to be aware of to start um, implementing AI in your own research domain. Uh, lastly, I will share some of the uh, areas where I have been able to apply the concept of uh, artificial intelligence together with uh, other uh, colleagues that I have collaborated with in the past years. Uh, I will also provide um, uh, some of the recommended books. I recommend some of the books that helped me in this uh, journey. So let's begin. The context uh, of AI, AI, uh, artificial intelligence has been for, for some time, but it has not been uh, very well implemented because of certain reason. Number one, uh, the data that is needed to, um, to bring out the value of AI or the originality or the 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 inno, uh, innovation in AI are not really available uh, in the past decades. Also, we we don't have uh, the technologies such as cloud computing, such as Internet of Things, that could support this technology. But now, in the fourth industrial revolution, with the um, concept of big data, with the availability of a large amount of data, and also with connectivity, such as uh, the technology of Internet of Things, and also uh, high performance computa uh, computing uh, facility or uh, computing um, equipment that we now have today uh, by virtue of cloud computing and other uh, advances in semiconductor this gives artificial intelligence the needed um, environment to, to, to perform well. So um, that's the context 
AI is actually uh, one of the key technologies of the fourth industrial uh, revolution. That is why it's very important. It's a, it's a hot topic uh, today. Now, when we talk about artificial intelligence, what we are just talking about is the ability of machines to learn and reason like humans. So uh, what we are just saying is that we want to empower uh, non-living things, uh, objects. We want to empower them with the ability to reason like human. Uh, machine learning is a subset, just like you can see in this diagram. Machine learning is just a subset of AI. There are different other ways by which you can achieve intelligence in objects. Uh, for example, in embedded system, you can uh, use programming. You can program um, microchips to be able to behave in a certain way at different times. But machine learning is the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Uh, another subset of artificial intelligence is deep learning. And this is the ability to learn from uh, big data using a deeper neural network. What do I mean? If you look at this diagram on the right, on my own right hand side, you see a simple neural network and you also see a deep neural network. A, a simple, a neural network, neural network generally has three different components. First, you have the input layer, you have the hidden layer, and you have the output layer. All those nodes uh, represent the neuron because artificial neural network was designed to mimic uh, human brain. How neurons in the human brains are connected to uh, perform a uh, great task that human being has the capacity to, to do. But the difference between the simple neural network and the deep neural network that we have here is that a single neuron, a simple neural network only has one hidden layer. But a deep learning neural network has multiple hidden layer, which gives it, uh, so the advantage of the deep learning neural network is that it has uh, the opportunity to process big data by virtue of that uh, multiple uh, hidden layer. So that's why now when you have, that means, when you have large volume of data to work with, uh, you will be you get uh, high efficiency using a deep learning neural neural network. Um, AI generally or machine learning generally uh, has the capability to model uh, different situations. For example, the first one is the regression problem. It has the capability to model reg a regression problem. And what do we mean by that? Whereby you want to predict uh, your outcome, your prediction outcome is a single value, a single continuous value. If so if you want to predict a number, for example, you want to predict the wind speed, uh, that, that's a continuous value. You want to predict a value. You want to predict um, what the weather will be like tomorrow. You want to predict um, continuous value. So that's a regression problem. And you can use AI to um, model that problem. Uh, the second one that you can uh, use AI to model is classification. So that means you can have a regression problem and you can have a classification problem. What we mean by classification is that maybe you want to, for example, you want to be able to receive an input which will be image of persons. And from that facial expression, you want to be able to classify or you want to be able to determine whether that individual is a male or a female. So that is a class. It's not, you are not trying to predict a continuous value. Rather, you are trying to classify. You are trying to categorize your input into a particular class. Now, in that instance, if the number of classes, the number of possible classes you have is limited to two, whether male and female, or you have yes or no, false or true or false, that's 
um, maybe you have healthy and non-healthy, as the case may be in health-related um, uh, applications, uh, that means you are dealing with a binary classification. You want to uh, separate a, group, um, a number of things into two different groups. But if you are dealing also, you can use AI to classify um, a number of things into multiple groups. That is more than three, more than two classes. Uh, that's a multi-class classification problem. These are uh, on the high level. These are things that AI can so can 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 help us to achieve. So uh, you need to first of all determine that when you want to start any AI project. So um, let's look at the research trend in AI. Uh, looking at uh, Scopus database as of um, October 2022, that's this year, uh, I discovered that AI research that I documented uh, started out in 1959 with very little progress over the years, but we can see that recently, maybe around around the, uh, in 2000, from 2001, there has been exponential growth in uh, the outputs that we now have uh, as uh, in, the, in the area of AI research. And it's continuously growing. Uh, and it's, so today we now have in uh, 2019 alone, to between 20, 2019 till date, we, we have more than more than 150,000 publications in AI that are related to AI, but that's globally. Let's compare that to what we have in Nigeria. You can see that, um, yeah, it started in 1959, but actually in Nigeria, we started to uh, tap into this in 1988. So if you look at the volume, the volume is quite low, even as of today, even though the first thing you see is that there's a similar trend. There is also an exponential growth in the output of AI research in Nigeria as well, but we're still talking about less than 500 for the whole country in a year. So this is the latest one in 2022. We have not even yet hit 500 research output uh, um, nationally. So this is something um, that we need to, to, to look into to encourage um, uh, Nigerian researchers to, to get more into this domain. Also, let's look at distribution of authors in AI research. These are the top 15 authors globally in AI research. Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't think I've, I, I can see any Nigerian name there. Uh, also in uh, in Nigeria, these are the top uh, AI uh, top authors, top fifteen authors in AI research, and I'm happy that at least I'm among uh, the leading authors in in Nigeria in this in this research space. Um, distribution by affiliation, why the institutions that are leading. AI research globally. These are the institution. We discovered that Chinese academic of uh, Academy of Sciences is leading in this area. Uh, in Nigeria, currently, Covenant University is the leading uh, institution in AI research. Uh, with uh, looking at these metrics, uh, with over two. 100 uh, publications already that are related to, to, to AI. So followed by University of Illorean, University of Lagos, Landmark University, University of Ibadan, and so on and so forth. Um, by country, we see that United States and China are the, are the forefront of AI research globally, followed by India, United Kingdom. Nigeria is not part of the first uh, 15 countries. Um, but in Africa as well, I tried to look at it. We are not even the first in Africa. Egypt, South Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria are far ahead of 
Nigeria. We Nigeria produce has produced so far uh, a little above one thousand publication in uh, on AI research. Uh, what are the subject areas where people have applied uh, AI uh, so far? Now we see that the dominant uh, subject area is computer science, but yet we have other areas where um, AI has been applied to, for example, in engineering, uh, AI has been applied uh, consistently in uh, mathematics, medicine, physics, decision sciences, social sciences, material science, biochemistry, energy, and uh, others. So let's look at the, the subject area in AI research in Nigeria. I think it's almost the same. After computer science, we have engineering, uh, we have other areas, mathematics, energy, and so on and so forth. So this is to show that uh, AI research is actually multidisciplinary. It accommodates every discipline. And this is not that uh, people will, will use it. People are already using AI, applying AI in different um, feed of studies. Uh, the funding, most of the AI research funding comes from uh, National Natural Science Foundation. I believe that should be in China. Uh, National Science Foundation, that, and that should be from the United States. So that means there's a direct correlation between funding and research output. So if we want research output in Nigeria, that means we need to work more on the funding. In Nigeria, the top funder of AI research is Covenant University, and no wonder uh, they are the one uh, that has uh, the highest number of research publication in this area. Covenant University, Ministry of Higher Education, TED Fund, and so on and so forth. Um, now, what are the learning methods? Now that we have seen the gap that we need to fill as a nation, as an institution, I think we need to now see how can we begin to explore this opportunity. How can we get into this in different field of studies? Uh, there are three categories of the three learning methods in uh, machine learning or AI. Uh, the first is the supervised learning. This is a situation where by majority of uh, the majority of AI algorithms fall under this category. Uh, in this situation, the machine is trained using well-labeled data. That is, your data has labeled, they are well annotated. When you have, um, for example, if you have images or faces, uh, you, you have labeled each of the images as, okay, this is male, this is female. So you've had, <clears throat> you've annotated the images. Let me, let me just say it like that way. But when you, when you only have the input data, with no label, with no, you, you've not labeled what this data, the output of the data, that is that that can be categorized as unsupervised learning. And then we have in between, we have the semi-supervised learning. That means it's not supervised and it's not also unsupervised learning. So this is a situation whereby some of your data, uh, some of them uh, labeled and some of them of the data are not labeled. So um, this is more of the real world situation because you don't always have all your data labeled. Um, and then there is another one that is uh, known as reinforcement learning, whereby um, you just allow an agent to learn in an environment on its own. And uh, this um, use the concept of exploitation and explore, uh, exploration to, to reward. So in this situation, you reward positive action and you punish negative action. So when the agent receives negative reward over time, uh, the agent will learn that that action is not uh, something that it's supposed to take in subsequent moments. So the agent, we do more of actions that leads to positive reward and 
um, try to desist from doing or taking actions that attract negative rewards. Okay, so these are some of the architectures under each of the learning methods. For supervised learning, you'll be looking at um, maybe decision tree, naive bias, neural network, convolutionary neural network, deep belief network, recurrent neural network, all of these falls under supervised learning. That's for, so for supervised, we are looking at classification and regression. So that means your data must be labeled. For reinforcement learning, there are other also um, architecture and algorithms such as deep Q network, double Q learning, and uh, prioritize experience relay replay. For unsupervised learning, you can use unsupervised learning architectures for dimensionality reduction, for clustering, for density estimation, and these are also uh, there are different algorithms to to achieve this. Um, also, that's for most, also uh, specifically for deep learning architecture, you can categorize deep learning architecture as um, discriminative deep learning, as well as generative deep learning. So under each of them, we have different architecture that you can explore. Now, this is the process. I will try to spend some time on this uh, machine learning or deep learning process. The first thing, is your data. Without data, there is no machine learning, there is no deep learning. So the first thing is, is to obtain data, that is data collection. Once you have your data, your raw data, then you can divide. You have to divide your raw data into training data as well as testing data. So the training data is what you use to develop your model. Then you use your testing data to, um, to uh, evaluate the performance of your model because it will be wrong to evaluate the performance of your model with the same data that you use to train. It's just like uh, teaching a, a child uh, multiplication table two is two multiplied by two is four, two multiplied by three is six, and you still have two multiplied by two uh, because eventually what you want to avoid is memorization. You want the model to learn the logic, the relationship between the input, not just to memorize the answer. So this is a way to obtain a good generalization ability for your model. So the first thing you do after you divide your raw data into training and testing, and by convention is usually 40%, 70% training and 30% testing or 60% training and then 40% testing, whichever way. Um, then the first stage, uh, the next stage after um, data splitting is data preprocessing, which include categorical feature encoding. That means if you have uh, words, um, characters, like uh, maybe you have uh, state, state of origin, for example, that would be like, um, uh, or your Lagos, um, Quara, and those are in words, in alphabet. You need to convert those things to numbers because the computer cannot process um, uh, text. So the process of converting words, characters to numbers is a categorical feature encoding. The same, you do the same thing for your label. If you label as male and female, that means you have to maybe change it to something like zero and one or yeah, there are different label encoding techniques. Feature normalization, feature dimensionality reduction, those are all of these fall under data preprocessing. Model development. Then you move to model development, which involves setting up your architecture, selecting the hyperparameters, and training your model. Then you use the model that has been trained, which is the output from this uh, section. You use it to test, you test the model using your testing data, and then you get your performance evaluation. The performance evaluation metrics depends on the type of uh, problem that is being solved. If it is classification problem, you're looking at accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, false positive rate, and the likes. 
for regression problem, you'll be looking at uh, the mean square error, the regression coefficient, the root mean square error, and, and the likes. Now, to get started on the practical side, there are um, deep learning libraries and tools that you can use. I know popularly in the academics, uh, we use MATLAB. MATLAB also has toolbox for machine learning and deep learning, but the downside to MATLAB is that it's a commercial software, which is not freely available. So you need to buy it, you need to pay for the software. Um, but the good news is that we now have other open source libraries and tools, uh, software that you can use freely without needing to uh, pay anything. So such as uh, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, all of these are open source. So the advantage of that is that it will help to be able to uh, transfer the knowledge from academics to the industry because industry, most of the people in the industry prefer to use open source tools because it's easy to deploy. It, it's straightforward other than um, using something that is only that is limited to academics in a way. So yeah, so we can mostly what you need maybe the TensorFlow and Keras, or if you want to go into PyTorch, TensorFlow I believe was developed by Google, PyTorch was developed by Facebook, if I'm correct. Yeah. So uh, looking at the areas where I have applied AI in my research, I started uh, my uh, AI research in wireless communications, precisely trying to predict radio signal strength in wireless communication. We did that for 2G network, uh, 3G and 3G networks as at um, from um, 20, 2016 to 2019. I think I worked on that, okay, 2018 to 20, 2018 and 2019, uh, they're about. And uh, these are the list of publications. So we try to, um, li like I said, you start with data collection. So we conducted the data collection, uh, get the right set of input data with the labels and then train different um, AI methods. So if you look at here, we try to use uh, artificial neural network, try to use, um, uh, adaptive neural FUSI inference system, uh, an extreme learning machine for this project, different areas. So also in my PhD, I focus on the application of uh, AI uh, to cybersecurity, uh, precisely botnet attack detection. How can we detect attack in uh, Internet of Things networks? And uh, some of this research were published in reputable journals. Uh, such as the IEEE Internet of Things uh, journal. Um, also, the work evolved into the use of federated learning to preserve privacies of user information. So federated learning is a, a new uh, AI technology that was designed to ensure privacy of information. So instead of you collecting data into a central location, you can carry out um, your machine learning modeling at the edge in uh, on, on users' devices instead of collecting their data. By that, we can preserve the privacy of sensitive information. Also, uh, in previous projects with uh, Professor Emmanuel Aditiba at Covenant University, we worked on, um, uh, we applied AI to EdCare uh, Edcare problem, uh, precisely the detection of art defect in athletes. How can we detect defect in the heart of athletes while they are still on the field so as to prevent sudden death? So we, the, some undergraduates worked on the project on how to collect the data. I worked on the um, AI modeling part of it and we were able to uh, published this paper in Cogent Engineering Journal. Uh, what this project is all about is that based on the input, you are able to classify 
the state of the art of the athlete into whether normal or three other heart defects that are common in athletes. So uh, if you see, looking at the result, we got at 90% accuracy uh, for a particular class, 100% uh, for other classes and 60% for another class. Yeah, which um, seems to be a good result. Uh, we've applied in, in collaboration with um, Dr. Olamide Jogmola, uh, we've applied AI in energy systems also, uh, and also in collaboration with my wife, Inyolua Folabi, we've applied, um, and, and as supervisor at the undergraduate level, we applied AI to in chemistry, and we published two papers in, uh, in FCBI journal. Um, I have a current project in Lautec with uh, one of my lecturers there when I was uh, an undergraduate student uh, in collaboration with his current uh, pro uh, final year project and an industry expert from Ikeja Electrics. We are looking at how to develop uh, a high model for wind power prediction in our telecommunication base station in Nigeria. So that is ongoing uh, because we're looking at how to replace the possibility of powering um, base station, telecommunication base station in Nigeria with uh, wind power instead of fossil fuel to combat climate change problem. Um, yeah. In conclusion, uh, these are some of the books that helped me. If you can lay your hand on them, they are uh, hands on, uh, that is, they involve a lot of practical. And then you can get started with that. You can start with Python, learn how to use Python to develop deep learning models. Um, uh, thank you very much for having me this morning. And I'm happy to take any question if there is any. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah.